welcome to our annual gathering. Um, we founded Astria 22 years ago today, and so we're delighted to be with you this evening with, in, in our community for positive change to talk about system change, fear and greed versus love and sharing. So thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Just to give you a quick idea of the structure of the evening, the program will start with a tribute to Richard Owler. He was an incredible pioneer who had become a friend of ours. And Tom is going to give a, uh, uh, present some ideas about systems and system change before we welcome Brandon McLean, um, another pioneer and change maker. And at that stage, the conversation may range from straw bale houses to politics. So. A bit of housekeeping here. Do please keep your microphones muted. Um, thank you for your help with the audio. We're having a kind of an open meeting, so in order to be sure that everyone can hear well, we just need the microphones off until we open the conversation up at, um, after we've spoken to Brandon. Of course, if you want to make any comments, I'll try to be monitoring the chat box so you can type anything in at any time. Um, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, our Breathe Think Flow channel, hello and welcome. And please subscribe and of course love and share it. Our Breathe Think Flow channel has stories and practical demonstrations and discourses all tied together with the thread of the big picture thinking for positive change. So please browse if there's anything there. You might find things of interest to you. Also, if you're via YouTube um, and you'd like to join the community, just visit astria.net and sign up. Easy as that. It would be wonderful to connect with you. Um, I'm going to read a short poem. Um, it's actually lyrics to a song about global system change by one of the most famous change makers of our era. It was released on a 1971 album. It's Imagine by John Lennon. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger. A brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. So I'm going to hand over to Tom now who incidentally shares a birthday with John Lennon and I just realized by strange coincidence today that John Lennon died on the 8th of December 1980 so there's some sort of thread or cosmic rhythm, rhythm happening there. Anyway Thank you again, and over to you, Tom. Hello, everybody. Um, all of you are friends. I'm very lucky to have you with me. I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much um, for joining. Uh, let's see where we go. I have a few better So notes. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, systems, um, system change. What is a system? Simply a group of interacting, interrelated, or independent elements forming a complex whole. Um, so um, I sent out the invitations to a lot of people and Alan Kalir um, received it. He lives in Australia, Sydney, so he's obviously asleep now or out at the pub at two o'clock in the morning. Um, and he replied saying, I think it's interesting that you're delving into the ideas of systems thinking. If there's one thing I've learned is that system thinking really works. Frankly, it's the way that I operated initially in science and subsequently in business. He has two doctorates. In science, you're thinking systems all the time. In business, many interrelationships between elements in the business environment are not thought through carefully enough. I could and can do better than others, which was, is, to my advantage, massively. So, 
Um, here's a fellow who's nearly hitting retirement, worked in the field of science and business, and understands that when you look at the interrelationships, you can really improve and do better. It's a shame it's not done more. So what systems are we referring to in this conversation? We're talking about everything. We're talking about the natural world, the biosphere and everything in it. The universe. How does the system of the universe work? But we're also talking about the virtual world. Politics, economics, ideas. Those are systems too. Um, and a good example of a system is you. Um, we're a system, a living organism. And within us are other interconnected systems. Right? Um, we can use ourselves as a frame of reference to understand systems, either our family system, the business system, and so on. In our human system, we have a nervous system for communication. We have a distribution system, the circulatory system. We have energy from our muscles. Uh, we have to get rid of waste, sweat, and so on. Um, we have to balance ourselves and make sure we don't get too hot or too cold. So that's hormones and such like. We have to grow and shrink. We have to make more of ourselves. So we're, we can be a benchmark for other systems. And we can look at ourselves, well, if we're fit, that's a reference point. And if we're not fit, well, why not? Um, we're going to talk about holonics, which is an unfamiliar word. It came across, I came across this 20 years ago in engineering. And a holon is something that is simultaneously a whole and a part of something else. I, th this resonated very strongly with me because it was at a time when I was asking questions about why things are the way they are. And I realized that we are all connected. We uh, are one. The whole universe is one entity. There is no actual distinction and differentiation between um, the various entities. Um, uh, this definition is quite helpful because it's a self-organizing dissipative structure. And that's what human systems are like. They are self-organizing at their essence. That's a natural system. Um, and uh, we, I am a part, I'm a whole in myself, but I'm also a part of other systems. I'm a part of my family. I'm a part of my society. I might be a part of my business, my school, whatever it is. And I influence those things. Um, now, there's a talk of memes. Now, sometimes we think of memes as being the little cat pictures that float around on Facebook or other social media. Um, but in a more um, analytical context, a meme is an idea, a way of behaving. Um, and so they're cultural holons. So the French have a particular way of doing things, the English, the Irish. And those can be de defined as memes, cultural holons. A fractal illustrates the idea of the holonic structure. So this is the Mandelbrot fra fractal. And what you can see is that the pattern keeps repeating at subsequent layers of more and more detail going in and coming out. Okay. So, that's about systems. Why are we talking about fear and greed? Oh, I forgot tri Richard's tribute. I'm going to have to come back to that. Okay. Fear and greed versus love and sharing. Um, so, I'm going to talk um, about a little uh, story. Once upon a time, in 1991, I was in Indonesia. Um, and I was pretty down. It was difficult times. Um, I was uh, trying to start up a venture capital fund in a, a real cowboy environment. Um, and things were not going well at all. Uh, my girlfriend was very distressed. The company was giving me um, a lot of blowback, although I was doing most of the work and getting paid the least. Um, and I was walking around Jakarta and I came to this church, which is a cathedral, and in the gardens they have a little statue of Mary. And I mention that because today is, of course, the feast day of the um, Immaculate Conception um, as well, uh, which is a strange coincidence. But it was sitting in front of that statue when I suddenly came to me that the world is ruled by fear and greed. And I didn't like that idea and I thought we should try and change it. Well, very soon after that, the stock market crashed. I got fired. That wasn't a bad thing. 
um, because it meant I could go back to spend time with my girlfriend um, and take another path. Um, but that idea stuck with me, this idea of fear and greed, and whether or not we in this modern society with so much could change into a different way of doing things. Why now? Why are we talking about system change now? We've been doing this for 20 years, and it just sort of seemed to come out over the last months. Um, and this quote from Martin Wolf, who's um, a highly regarded writer for the Financial Times, um, really sort of put some of the, the idea in context. But it occurred to me when I was looking at COP26 that really nothing was achieved there. But what I saw that a lot of people were realizing that governments, companies, whoever they are, they are not willing and maybe they're not able, but they're not willing to help because we've been talking this game for over 30 years about changing systems, about fixing the climate, about um, reducing the inequity around the world, and nothing's happening. So I really think people are getting a bit frustrated, and it's obviously been concentrated by issues like the pandemic. Excuse me. <clears throat> So, we know we want to change the system, we know we want things better, but we know what we want to change from, but not what to. We know what we want to change from the current status, and we thought everything was fine because we had this sort of agreed trade-off of freedom for stability. We would work for other people provided we were able to have a life uh, a house, send our children to, ch to kids, uh, to, to school, and, uh, and have a retirement and a pension. So that was the stability. We wouldn't have war, we wouldn't have problems, but we would give up an element of our freedom because we would be working for other people. We would not own the product of our work. That's, you know, a bit like the feudal system, very close to slavery, but that's basically the trade-off. We'd have the stability, we wouldn't fight, we wouldn't complain, provided we had our house. And there's a growing realization now that stability is not an option. There's a financial crisis that's an ongoing legacy from 2008 and prior. We're still living with it, broken financial system, still over leveraged. We can see the climate breakdown. We've just had another storm pass through Ireland, ripping off the sheets from the, the, the roof. We've got a pandemic which people don't understand and are not able to address. Clearly political ineffectiveness um, around the world, um, <clears throat> whichever country we're in. Um, and there's great economic fragility, which was demonstrated particularly at the beginning of the pandemic when um, inventory pipeline just completely broke down and you couldn't get food. Um, I don't know, uh, you can't get goods manufactured in your own location. Uh, there's very little manufactured in Ireland. We're very lucky in Carlo because um, there are some amazing engineers in basically working out of small backyard garages uh, which can make, who can make airplane parts and so on. But that skill is evaporating. If you want something, you basically buy it from Asia. Uh, the legitimacy of the financial system has been brought into question. Um, clearly, the pension funds are bankrupt. Uh, banks are not serving us, they are just padding their own um, nests and so on. Uh, no, we, we face working for our lives, maybe to pay off a mortgage, and then we die. And increasingly people are being faced with getting um, uninteresting jobs where they have little control, or clicky jobs where they're just playing on a computer, so they're not actually doing something of benefit for others. It's a virtual economy. And I think that's why there's that, that desire to change. So, the systems need to change. It's the virtual systems of humanity that are bumping up against the reality of how the universe works. Um, now, there's an overarching structure and dynamic to the system of today, which is contrary to the, nature, the way nature works, and it's reflecting in the dominated cultural memes of today, like religion, government, laws, commerce, education, food production, and so on. And I think what that dominating 
um, consciousness is patriarchy. Now, patriarchy arrived, uh, emerged as a survival meme when resources appeared to become too limited for tribes to progress. Okay? When people were hunter-gatherers, they were healthy and had ample resources. Collaboration enabled people to overcome seemingly insurmountable threats. Meanwhile, that human trait of curiosity and problem-solving fueled the development of technology, of know-how about how the real world works. When faced with unknowable problems like, what is that bright light in the sky, placeholders were used like, oh, that's the god of the sun. And then, preying on the natural instinct for preservation, some might make up another story like, give me gold and I'll make sure the sun comes up tomorrow. There were many gods and goddesses and they reflected the natural dynamic of human experience. Societies were polytheistic and matrifocal because everyone knew who their mother was and where babies came from, but they probably didn't know who their fathers were and men were of little help in making or nurturing infants. The best they could do was help get food and shelter. As tribes grew, food and shelter became scarce, so they expanded, the tribes expanded, and eventually bumped up against one another. So what that did is it kicked in survival mode. Okay, and, and those are where, you, survival mode is where you look after yourself. You don't lean on the natural human altruism. Um, the tribes chose to coordinate in order to protect territories, but that required control and organization because it was a survival situation. No food equals death. Control was instigated by hierarchy and obedience was justified by a mantra of there is only one God and his name is Yahweh. If you didn't do what Yahweh said, you were the enemy. Of course, the person who told you what Yahweh said was a god, also known as a king or a priest, and always a man. It is a powerful system. It had to be. It is for survival, that control system. Now, we can't all be kings. We can all be human. If we would cultivate our innate higher nature. And what is that higher nature? Well, this chart that you're looking at shows the holonic framework of emergent consciousness. And I want to say that this pattern is not about humans. It's a natural thing. It's a universal pattern. And this quote from Carl Sagan puts it emotionally, perhaps. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. And I think Carl Sagan had a lot of lessons for us which we would do better to listen to. So, <clears throat> this is a, a summary of where we've come from. And that funny fellow asking what's it all about is demonstrating the sort of step change in, uh, in the emergence of consciousness. The fact that humans can actually look at themselves in a way that no other creature can do. But don't be fooled into thinking that humans are the only life form on earth and that we are irreplaceable. We're not. We can be got rid of either by our own suicide or by a sad accident. <clears throat> so, going back to that table that we were looking at earlier, you can see this pattern of behavior. So, when you're uh, uh, living in the rough, you're in a survival relationship. You want relationships with your immediate tribe. And you want to understand yourself. But once you recognize yourself and you can look at yourself, you can start to develop more um, human characteristics, such as collaboration, such as altruism. And we've debased those values and those behaviors 
by pretending that we don't have enough to eat or we don't have enough places to live and so on, by creating this um, fiction of limited resources. And the reason they feel limited is because a couple of people like Jeff and Elon and Bill own everything. But there's no moral justification for it because the meritocracy does not exist. So that's uh, the basic framework. Um, I was hoping that we might discuss some of the systems that we have in place, um, such as religion, such as capitalism, um, the energy systems and so on. But I think, well, I will read about the energy fossil fuel subsidies because this is obviously right on the top of the agenda. Um, and I think, I'm just going to do that. Um, <clears throat> the latest International Monetary Fund report estimates 6.5% of global GDP, GDP, that's $5 trillion, was spent on fossil fuel subsidies in 2017. And that was half a trillion dollars more than two years prior. Now, I don't know what it is today, but I can imagine it's a lot more and still 6.5%. Well, probably more than 6.5% because GDP has tanked since the pandemic. Um, and that's a lot of money. And if we put that kind of money um, to remediating the problem of energy consumption, we'd be in a much better position. So, let me see. Does anybody have any queries or questions about system change, which we can chat about? No? Well, thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.